Go enter the Masonic Lodge uh, and take the first introductory uh, pledges. First of all, they blindfold you. They put a noose around your neck. They bury your left chest. You roll up your left pants leg. Take off your left shoe. Kneel before the altar. And, of course, you, then you take these horrible oaths where you swear. If you ever reveal anything uh, that... Uh, you have heard why in the first uh, degree why they cut out your take out tear out your tongue cut your throat bury you in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck at low tide so when the tide comes in you're dead if you're not already dead second degree of course they cut out your entrails and burn them and feed them to the birds of the air third degree uh, they cut out your heart I mean it's by the fourth degree things are really pretty bad adult men swear these oaths but what you have to understand uh, is that as you're kneeling blindfolded uh, before the altar before a Bible Holy Bible, uh, the worshipful master asks you, what do you desire? And you are told to answer the light. You have no idea what the light is, uh, but you answer the light. In the second degree, you're told to ask for more light. And the third degree, you want even more light. Uh, many of you here, I suspect, are born-again Christians, and you've, many of you have prayed the sinner's prayer, and when you pray the sinner's prayer, uh, something happens. Your, your life changes forevermore. I know this happened to me, and it's happened to many people, uh, but when the mason uh, swears this oath, something happens to him too. For he has requested the light to come in and dominate his life. Now this is Albert Pike, the leading Masonic philosopher of the last century, and in his book Morals and Dogma, which was given to every uh, Mason who advanced through the degrees uh, up until 1974, this was the Masonic Bible. And what Pike wrote on page 104, Masonry conceals its secrets from all the, except the adepts and the sages of the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve to be misled to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. In other words, you ask for the light, but we're not going to let you know what the light is. On page 819, the blue degrees are about the outer court of the portico of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed for the initiate, but he is intensely misled by false interpretation. It is not intended that he shall understand them, for it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts and the princes of masonry. He goes on to tell us uh, that on page 722, if you desire to gain admission to the sanctuary, we have said enough to show you the way. And if you do not, uh, it's useless for us to say more, as it has been useless for us to say so much. On page 781, uh, he tells you, if you reflect, my brother, you will no doubt suspect that some secret meaning was concealed in these words. But what's the secret meaning? The, on page 219, the right raises a corner of the veil, even in the degree of apprentice, for there declares that masonry is a worship. So what are they worshiping? Well, on pages 839 and 840, uh, of morals and dogma. And I'm just going to take the bottom paragraph because this is the important one. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute. The absolute is capitalized, reflecting deity. Of this doctrine that is summed up in a word of this word, capital W, deity. In fine, alternately lost and found again, that was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiations. It was the same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated Order of the Templars that became for all secret associations of the Rosy Cross, that's the Rosicrucians, of the Illuminati, and of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason of their strange rites, of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. In other words, if you get into these things, you will get power, power that you cannot believe and you will have great wealth, but at what cost? Well, when I went through Professor Quigley's papers, and uh, of course we found the interview with him uh, that we've already discussed, and if you get the interview, you'll actually hear him talking about these crazy right-wingers who come to him, and they show him that symbol, and they tell him that's the symbol of the Illuminati. And he says, that's not the symbol of the Illuminati. That's been around for 5,000 years. That's the symbol of the, uh, the, the mystery religions of antiquity, and that's what it really is. This is the symbol uh, of the mystery religions of Persia and Babylon and, and, 
and Egypt. Uh, this goes back to the ancient pagan religions, uh, which are the basis of all modern day secret societies. And every single one of them ties into this. Now, uh, you recall that we were talking about the Knights Templar. What were the Knights Templar? They were a religious order that in the, um, oh, uh, about the 1,000, 1,100 went on the Crusades, and they were to guard the temple, where once it stood, Solomon's Temple, Temple Square, where today uh, the great mosque of Almar is. But there, of course, they came in contact uh, with people who were part of the mystery religions. And they came back to Europe uh, in the 1200s, they became the most significant financial force in Europe. They became the bankers of Europe. And using a fractional reserve banking system, uh, all of the monarchies of Europe became indebted to them, just as governments today spend more than they have. So in those days, they spent more than they had, and the Templars dominated what was going on. But, uh, of course, then it was discovered uh, that the Templars were Luciferian, and Jacques de Molay, their leader, uh, was burned at the stake in the early 1300s. Uh, of course, today, the uh, young people who are sons of, of Masons belong to the de Molays, as did uh, Bill Clinton. Let me read again uh, that final statement on page 840 of Morals and Dogma. It was the remembrance of this scientific and religious absolute, of this doctrine that is summed up in a word, of this word, and fine, alternately lost and found again, that is was transmitted to the elect of all ancient initiation. It was this same remembrance preserved, or perhaps profaned, in the celebrated order of the Templars that became, for all the secret associations of the Rosy Cross, of the Illuminati, of the Hermetic Freemasons, the reason for their strange rites, and of their signs more or less conventional, and above all, of their mutual devotedness and of their power. What is it about? Well, on page 321 of Morals and Dogma, uh, why uh, Pike lays it right out. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual or selfish souls? Doubt it not. Why, it's simply Luciferianism. If you read Manly P. Hall's a book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, uh, he's very, very clear what it's about. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. That's what it's all about. It's Luciferianism and manifested in every aspect of our society today. Little wonder they want to take God uh, out of our schools. In a book called Spiritual Politics, written by Corinne McLaughlin and Gordon Davidson, a very important book written by people who are involved in the occult, they will explain to you what it's really all about. J.P. Morgan, the great banker, of course, was into astrology. He said his astrology told him how to make his investments to make all of his money. Henry Ford was involved in the occult. Andrew Carnegie was involved in the occult. And Kurt House, the man who was able to control Clemenceau in Orlando and Woodrow Wilson in FDR and be able to go in the room and talk to people uh, and, of course, convince them uh, to take up his ideas. The man who was so intent upon uh, having communism survive when others wanted to do away with it, uh, he was one of the leaders of the occult movement. And, of course, this is why he left a copy of the protocols for those in the future uh, to uncover. And so we begin to see these patterns uh, unfolding. Let me read again what Manly P. Hall said, because this is so important. When the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. Uh, you can read the book, uh, of the book of Revelation, uh, by Barbara Marks Hubbard. Uh, the original manuscript was actually uh, been, been somewhat altered. This book you can get at bookstores today. Uh, it tells about the coming horror that is going to occur in the mass extermination of people. Uh, this book was published by the Lawrence Rockefeller Fund for the Enhancement of the Humanities. But in the original text, which we have, uh, she says this. Now, this book is... Uh, is channeled to her, uh, and she readily admits that by what she calls the Christ light, but I believe is the demonic spirit. And she is rewriting the book of Revelation so you, if you are an occultist, can understand it. She quotes Revelation 6, 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and the beasts of the earth. 
And then she goes on to say, out of the full spectrum of human personality, one-fourth is electing to transcend with all their heart, mind, and spirit. One-fourth, however, is resistant to election. They were undetracted by life ever-evolving. Their higher self is unable to penetrate the density of their mammalian senses. They can't be reached. They're defective seeds. Ladies and gentlemen, she's talking about you and me, those of us who worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we approach the quantum shift from creature human to co-creative human, the destructive one-fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Fortunately, you, dearly beloveds, are not responsible for this act. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy, for we are the riders of the pale horse, death. Let's go on and just point out that this is a, a book written in about 1900 by Rudyard Kipling, and all of his books at that time had the swastika on the front. Remember, he wrote the eulogy to Cecil Rhodes. Of course, he himself was involved in the occult. That's an occult symbol. That's why Adolf Hitler used the swastika, because it was an occult symbol. Uh, of course, Harry Truman, who gave China and Eastern Europe to the communists, was a 33rd degree Mason. Winston Churchill, uh, who insisted on the invasion of Gallipoli and of North Africa to create the carnage that would justify a world government, was a Druid, entered the Druids in 1908, uh, was a third degree uh, Mason, and that's why he got along so well with FDR, uh, Herbert, pardon me, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who uh, was in office. Uh, it didn't really matter whether the Democrats or Republicans were there. He was always in office. He was a 33rd degree Mason. That's how you get ahead in government. Let me take you uh, to the material I gave you a little earlier uh, from the Lucius Trust. And you remember I showed you this page before uh, where they were talking about meditation letting in the light. Well, now you can know what the light is. Light is Lucifer. Let's go down to uh, the second Roman numeral, alignment. We project a light of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet and the planetary heart, the great ashram of Sanat Kumara. Who is Sanat Kumara? We'll just change the letters around. It's Satan, of course. I mean, they're so openly and so blatant about it. But most people don't understand. Where does communism fit in this whole scenario? Oh, well, uh, Reverend Richard Wormbrand uh, was a Protestant minister living in Romania. He was arrested, put in prison, and tortured for 14 years to break his faith. Many of the ministers who were with him, of course, eventually broke. Many of them died in prison. When he finally got out of prison, he, he couldn't understand why they didn't just put him in prison. Uh, why did they want to break his faith? And so he began to study Karl Marx. And, of course, what he found out that Karl Marx, contrary to everything you've ever been led to believe, was not an atheist. And Karl Marx did not believe in socialism and communism. He was a Satanist, and he realized that socialism would destroy Western Christian civilization, which he hated. And that's why he embraced it, as did Proudhon and Bakunin and all of the other leading socialists at that time. They weren't socialists. They embraced socialism to destroy America. Of course, here you'll see the emblem of the Trilateral Commission. You look very closely, you'll see three, three sixes joined together by an upside-down broken cross the Trilateral Commission, created by David Rockefeller and Zygmunt Brzezinski. We started our discussion today with a poem from James Russell Lowell. And I want to give you the full text of that because it really lays out what this battle is all about. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. In that strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side, some new cause, some new messiah, offering each the bloom of bright. And the strife goes on forever, twixt the darkness and the light. Then decide with truth is noble and to share her wretched crust, ere her cause brings fame and fortune, and is prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses, while the coward stands aside, until the multitudes make virtue of the faith they had denied. By the light of burning martyrs, Christ, thy bleeding feet we track, toiling up new Calvaries ever with a cross that turns not back. Though the cause of evil prospers, yet his truth alone is strong, though a portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong. But that scaffold sways the future, for in the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. And that's what it's all about. Martin Luther understood this, this battle when he wrote that great hymn that we used to sing in church. We don't sing it anymore. A mighty fortress is our God when he said, I'm not, you know, for still our ancient foe doth cease to worketh woe. His power and craft are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Yeah. 
And St. Paul understood it uh, in, in Ephesians uh, 6.11 when he wrote, uh, For um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this earth, against spiritual wickedness in, in high places. And the devil understood it because on the Mount of Temptation he said to Jesus Christ, uh, Why, uh, you know, if you'll simply fall down and worship me, all of these kingdoms on earth can be yours. But unfortunately, the modern church doesn't understand it. And our ministers tell us, oh, you're not to be involved in anything. Why, Romans 13 will tell you uh, that if you oppose what's going on in the world today, uh, why, of course, you're opposing the will of God. Now, at the beginning of this program, uh, I put on the screen uh, this emblem. And I want to tell you what it is. It appears at the top of page 839 of Morals and Dogma. And you will see uh, the... Um, compass and the square. Here's the compass, here's the square, Masonic symbols. Man and woman join together in one body. When they join together, of course, they create life, uh, just as God does. Uh, you see the symbols of men and women. On the opposite side, you see a uh, modified swastika and an altered cross. You see the symbols of light above, the sun and the moon, always symbols of light and of the occult uh, movement. But you see where their feet are standing while they're standing on the dragon, who is Lucifer, which of course overshadows the world. Now, every Mason has seen this. Most of them really don't understand it, you see. Uh, but why are their feet firmly planted on the dragon? Well, because the dragon is the basis of Masonry and of all the occult secret societies, Theosophy, Rosicrucianism, the Knight Templar, the Illuminati. They are all Luciferian. And yet most people would look at that and never understand because, you see, throughout all history, uh, these secret societies have been used uh, to demonstrate the existence of the Luciferian movement, which dates back to the Garden of Eden, and time and time again throughout history, uh, we see it being played out in Cain and rebellion against God because he didn't like God's commandment that there had to be a blood, blood sacrifice, and so he kills Abel. Uh, we find it again at the time of Noah when Luciferianism had literally taken over the world and God had to destroy the world except for Noah and his family. Uh, we saw it uh, with Nimrod trying to unite all the world and build the temple of Babylon. Uh, we see the evil taking control in Sodom and Gomorrah. They of course, they had to destroy that completely. Uh, you hear that Joshua was told he was to kill everyone in, in, uh, in Jericho. Why? Why? Because they were sacrificing their children uh, to, to the gods. And uh, this is one thing God could not tolerate. Only uh, Rahab and, and her family were spared. Uh, they were to kill every living thing in Jericho because the evil had taken hold. But the tragedy is that evil has taken hold of our land today. And America is being used uh, to push this world government on all the rest of the world. This is what Desert Storm was about. This is what Kosovo was about. This is what Vietnam was about. This is what Korea, the First World War, the Second World War, all to bring about this world government. Well, now you know the secrets that have been concealed for people for so long. And, of course, we hope that uh, you will become educated, begin to educate others to understand that we are not involved in a uh, political battle, we're not involved in an ideological battle, we're not involved in a cultural war. We're involved in a spiritual war that is being fought on a political and ideological and cultural battlefield. And it is our job uh, to be involved and to educate people as to what is happening. It was in 1838 when uh, Abraham Lincoln addressed the Lyceum in Springfield, Illinois, and he said this, At what point should we expect the approach of danger? By what means should we fortify ourselves against it? Should we expect some transatlantic giant to step the ocean and crush us with a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe and Asia and Africa combined could never by force uh, take a drink from the Ohio or make a mark on the Blue Ridge, not in a trial of a thousand years. Then at what point should we expect the approach of danger? And I answer, if it ever reaches, it must spring up among us. It can never come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its authors and its finishers. As a nation of free men, we shall live on through all time or die by suicide. And ladies and gentlemen, we're dying by suicide today. Let me quote, close with that quotation which is engraved in the marble behind uh, Thomas Jefferson's statue uh, in the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. God, who gave us life, gave us liberty, 
But can the liberty of a nation be secure when the conviction has been forgotten that liberty is the gift of God? I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. Our job, first of all, is to pray as if it's up to the Lord and then to work as if it's up to us to educate people and to bring the truth uh, to as many people as we can in the time that we have left. Let me thank you for your attention and for being such a good audience. God bless you. What is your problem? Just that, sir. Okay. I'm a Christian, sir. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything about, it about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, see the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. No. And you're, hey, what you're about confirming those hospitals? It. You, know, you know what, sir? <clears throat> Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not, we did not do these good deeds in your name. And you'll say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus said it? In Matthew chapter 5. Mercy. No. That's hard to believe. So you're a Christian and you don't know that. Actually. No, I really am. You are. Because exactly. I'm pure and virtuous. You're pure and virtuous. Okay. okay. Get out of here. <clears throat> See, this is what a Mason confesses, is that Lucifer is light.